time. Our fourth one will be tomorrow. It will be on weed management in small fruit. So if you haven't signed up for that one, uh, sign up today, and that will be a really good one uh, with a weed specialist from Rutgers. I'm Mary Conklin of the University of Connecticut, and today we're going to talk about the NUWA system. Uh, you can see it up on the screen. This is a home page at Cornell, and NUWA stands for Network for Environment and Weather Applications. This system is an excellent tool in your management toolbox for managing pests, for irrigation, and for thinning. It also works for many crops. So the newest system has about 20 weather-based IPM forecast tools in it. There's additional models that are being validated this coming season. And in Connecticut, I'll be working with Cornell on blueberry and strawberry pest models, which will be added once this process is completed. I'm going to walk you through what's on this. I'm not going to go through every single one of the pest models, but I do want to walk you through what's in this system and how it can hopefully help you. So this is the home page. You can scroll down and see the map. You can click on that map if you want to see what's uh, closer and grab it. Just move it over and you can see the stations that are in Connecticut. You can see the ones we have around us as well. So in Connecticut right now, we have uh, probably about 20 on farms. We have uh, one on a vegetable farm. Our school IPM program also has about 20 stations uh, at middle schools throughout the state. The Yukon Research Farm has one, and also the airports are automatically into this system. I wouldn't suggest you use the airport for temperature if that's close to you because there's a lot of pavement there and that's going to change things up. So we use uh, Rainwise IP100 stations that report every minute, used to be every 15 minutes, for air temperature, rainfall and in inches, relative humidity, leaf wetness, wind direction, speed, and many others. I want to show you what some of this is. So across the top, you see these different areas you can click on. We'll start with the weather data. So if I click on all weather data, it will show up. And because I've chosen Connecticut, it's always going to come up with Connecticut. So you can choose any number of states that have some of these, and it's the one that will come up for you all the time. So we'll look at the Wallingford came up. We'll look at the daily temperature in March. Then I need to click report. To click takes just a second for this all, all this data to show up. Good. And so you can see, we have average air temperature every single day. We have the maximum air temperature, minimum air, soil temperature. This is new this year. Uh, most of our stations in Connecticut have soil temperature sensors as well as soil moisture uh, sensors. It also gives us total precipitation leaf wetness, which will become very critical, as, as most of you know, come this springtime when we have green tissue out and we're looking at some of our disease issues. Relative humidity also plays an uh, important role, average wind speed. And keep in mind, this information is all cataloged on here. You can go back and you can look at this later on down the road if you find you have an infection and want to know what happened. All of this information is there. Solar radiation is used for the carbohydrate model, which I'll talk about a little later. And then the average soil tension. And this goes into our soil moisture, and I'll mention that one um, a little bit later. So all this inflation is here. You can also go under and get hourly if you, if you want to. Uh, you can get daily summary. You get degree days. So we'll assume that a pest model that you're looking at is not showing up in the system, you can still get the degree days and you can calculate yourself where you stand with a pest around you. So we'll again, we'll, and you can click on which one it is. Many pests uh, are out there and they don't all have the same base model. So we start with, most of them are about 50, but there are some that have these varying amounts. So you can choose which one you want. We'll stick with the 50. You can um, click get, get report. And you can see where we start. So this one is starting accumulating on January 1. It gives us the number of degree days that we have for a base 50. If we start accumulating on March 1st, we have we have nothing. And then so on. So again, this, this information is all cataloged in there for you. To go back. So we also can look at different information on here. 
the Northeast Regional Climate Center has some information on that you may be interested in. You can move over to that one. This one has more ma maps that are regional. It's not specific to our weather stations that we have right here in our state. Okay, so moving along a little bit further here, we look at the pest forecasts. So we have apple diseases and insects. This is where it really started. Leaf wetness, we do have great models. For those of you who are vegetable growers, there are some models in here as well. And then we have turf grass down further down at the bottom. So I just want to show you a couple of these. So we'll click on apple diseases. Of course, our big one coming up is, is scab. And we'll look at apple scab. But I also want to go back because if I show you what's on there now, it's going to come up to nothing. So I can click on date of interest and we're going to go back to last spring. And we'll just click on. And then again, you have to hit the calculate button and this is going to show the history of what was there. So one thing to keep in mind when you're going forward on this, if I get my screen to stand still, is you need to put in the green tip date for your location. You can change that. It's not going to interfere with the grower who has the weather station because it will just revert automatically back to what the uh, date was there. So if your date is off by even one or two days or even a week, change that. And then it will then recalculate all the information down here. So when we look down further here, we're looking at uh, this is May 15th, so this is current. Right now we do not have, last year we didn't have an infection, but you notice that we had one the two days before. So it will give you previous and then it was going to use the forecasted weather and it's going to go forward. It also will give you the average temperature during this period and the leaf wetness. If you scroll down even further, it does give you some management tools. So you can read the disease management, suggestions for what you can do. And again, going down even further, it's going to tell me if I had any other infection events prior to this. So if I start seeing some scab lesions showing up and wonder if something happened, did I miss one, I can go down into this area and I can look and see, did I miss an event? And if I did, you know, when did that happen? So a lot of very good information on this. Um, one thing I do want to show you right now is the fire blight. So we're going to choose under disease. I'm going to go for fire blight. We'll pick a different station. We'll go to South Glastonbury for this one. And again, I want to show you what happened last year. So we're going to scroll down to a different date and hit calculate. So for this one, it's important that you click on this link. So if there's no fire blight in your neighborhood last year, that's important to know. If it was in the neighborhood or on your farm, again last year, and then whether you know you have it active now, that's going to change what's going to happen further down. Then you also need to put in the first blossom open date on here. It's important that we have that in there because uh, we have to have open blossoms for fire blight infection to occur. So we'll put a date in here. We'll say our first one was a A little late, but we'll say that. So, okay, so they're saying first open blossom was on March 12. And you can click here if the bloom has not yet occurred. But we'll say that it did based on what happened last year. Fire blight was in the neighborhood. And it shows you two different things. There's a cougar blight model, which is up here on this line, which has been the standard in the newest system for several years. It's, just, it's a lot of standards that many people have used. But also, there's a Mary blight system. It's a very model that's also used for fire blight prediction. And in 2017, that model was also incorporated into the newest system, and that's on this second line right here. With this model, it's essential to begin using as soon as the apple blossoms are open. If you have pears uh, that bloom earlier than apples and are more susceptible to fire blight, then you put that date for first open pear flowers up in the model up here and not for your apple one. Just remember, infections cannot exist without open flowers. 
And again, you can scroll down. If you had applied streptomycin, you would put that in there. That would then change what's going to happen down here in your disease models. So they'll tell you what you can do based on your risk. Okay, so there's other disease models you can look at. We'll look at some of the, uh, let's look at an apple insect model now. So we have several to choose from in here as well. These are really good. We're going to look at the apple maggot model. And again, I want to go back in time so I can show you what happened in previous years. So we'll go back here. We'll select June 27. So if you know a first trap catch, enter it. If you don't, it's going to be done based on um, the degree day model. It'll tell you what's there. So a predicted first emergence occurs after about 796 to 1,297 degree days have accumulated up to that point. So here's your accumulation of degree days along this line down here. So we're within that degree day area. Uh, you can see what the degree days are for the base 50. And this will tell you when there, whether there is a problem coming up. And then you can look back down at pest status. So here on this date, apple maggot flies usually emerge first in unsprayed trees and so on. It tells you what else you can do. It also tells you some pest management suggestions for hanging lures up. So if we want to look at this just even a little later, we'll pick July 12 and see what happened. And again, things will change. The degree model continues. And there's more pest information on here for you to look at. So really a very good tool to use. Another thing I want to look at up here are the apple leaf wetness events. This is very good for historical information. So we can look at 2017, get the report, and it's going to tell you what happened. Really good to use when you're looking back on what happened last year. If you know you missed something, you saw something coming through when you were picking or packing, you can look back to see when was there an event. Did I miss it? When did I spray? What did I spray with? Maybe something needs to be tweaked in your program for the following year. So just something to keep in mind on that one. So going now, we do have grape forecast models in here. Some of them are lumped together. So for this, we have grape diseases, which are all lumped together. There's three of them. We have Phomopsis, powdery mildew, and black rot. And we'll, again, we need to look back on this one because nothing's going to show up at this time. So we'll just pick any old date. And again, it will tell me what happened in the past. This is the date for today, for July 19. And it will predict what's going to happen down the road. So you can plan based on the weather forecast what's going on. Again, phenological stage. You may not be there. So click on this link and put in the phenological stage that you are at. That will change what's happening. And then there's disease management recommendations for these three. Again, you can look at the grape infection um, events log. You can see what happened here. You can show the leaf wetness ones. This will just show up and it will show you exactly what had happened, whether you missed something, just like for the scab. So a very useful tool to have. There's also, I want to mention, this more information tab on the side. This will give you the fact sheets. You can click on any of these fact sheets, and it will take you to fact sheets that are on the Cornell website. And there's also pictures there as well, in case you aren't sure exactly what you're looking for. I want to show you the downy mildew. That's a little different than these others. So downy mildew, we have the state, we have our weather station, but we also need to choose the cultivar because they're not all uh, susceptible the same. So there's, there's not all of them are in here, obviously, but they do give you a range of the ones that are in here. So you could pick something and then, again, look at the date. Let's go back here. Just pick anything randomly and hit calculate, and it's going to show me what's going on. Okay, so if you notice, the green with the blue bar indicates that we had minimum conditions for an infection that actually were exceeded. You can scroll over, and this will tell you the leaf wetness 
you can see where we were going forward. And then the warning history. So all this information, very useful as a tool in your management practices. Let me get my window back over there. So when it comes to grapes, we also have one insect. That's all that we have there. So for the, for the berry moss. So this is predicated on knowing when the wild grape bloom is. If you have wild grapes on your property and you know when they bloom, put that date in. Otherwise, that date will automatically go in based on the degree day model for the area and based on some of the temperatures in the area. It will predict when that bloom date is. So that's very critical to know. And then you can scroll down again. It will tell you the first generation will cease and pupation will begin at approximately 500 degree days. If you look up here, that has the accumulated degree days going on right now. It also shows you right here. So if it's not going to happen until about 500, we're at 483. We're not quite there yet. If I just change that date, I'll we'll just say July 12 for the heck of it. So the second generation larvae are protected within the berries and completing the development. And this also will give you more degree day information as well going forward. Okay, so for vegetables, we do have quite a bit of vegetable disease models here. I know the one that seems to be really critical for growers is the uh, late bite model. So let's look at some of the tomato disease models. I just want to show you what we have up here for this. Of course, they're asking if you apply to fungicide. The answer for right now clearly would be no. What we have is late blight, early blight, septoria, and anthracnose. And we're going to go back again. And we'll just pick one and say, no, we did not apply a fungicide. So this is saying must read for best first fungicide decision. So it does give you some more information here on that. And then hit the get report. So this, is, this tells me right here that I hit the threshold. So we need to be looking out for it this past year um, on August 17th. There's more information on here. Again, you can click on the more information. Um, tab and it will give you fact sheets. This will show you the log for the Tomcast and this will show you the severity value log on it. So very good information to have on these when you're using when you're using the vegetable ones. If we want to go to the turf grass diseases, at this point unfortunately right now this is not tied to our weather stations that will be changing. So this is more of a regional map, and again, this is based on, this is from the forecast weather for turf. From It's also from Cornell, but you can zoom in on this one, and you can see where, where things are happening a little bit more. So dollar spot, this does not have the history. I can't go back and show you what happened last year on this one, because this is going from this point forward. This is always updated. Um, I could forecast for the next week, or daily forecast for the next week as well. But you have several different diseases you could choose from. So there's dollar spot, we have Pythium blight. You click on it and things will change. And again, we're not gonna change very much because this is at this time of the year. So let me see if I can get back here. There we go. All right, so there's a lot to look at on the on the pest forecast page. Now on station pages, again, you can look at all of these. You can just click on, on the station page. You can look at Cornell. Uh, you can, I mean, you can look at Connecticut. You click on Connecticut. It will show you all the different ones that we have here on the side. You can click on any of them, and you can go directly to that station. So if we look at South Glastonbury, again, this is going to show you exactly where that station is. You can pick up pest forecast fact sheets here and models. There's more quick links for that specific station. And you can zoom in and see exactly where that station is located on the farm. Okay, under crop management, we have a lot of things. So I mentioned the carbohydrate model 
um, where we have the solar radiation. So this is the apple carbohydrate model that they use on here. It's a tool that you want to use, if you've never used it before, in a small area. Try it. See what happens. See if you like it. You know how your farm is going to respond to your thinning. So we'll move back again. I'll just pick a date here. Now, I need to put the green tip date in. This is based on degree days, but if my green tip is different, I need to put that in. If my bloom date is different, I need to put that in as well. And then I'll hit the calculate. But here's a new message that just came up. This is for this, this is going forward because we've had such a variety in our weather. We have the droughts, we have stressors going on on the trees, we have frosts and freezes. So this model was developed based on everything being normal and healthy. And we haven't had that much very uh, lately in the past few years. So it, you need to take into that in account when you're using it. So read this thing about the model. They are working on trying to figure out how to alter this a little bit and take that into account. If you hit calculate, then it's going to show up. So we put in May 26 for last year, and this is going to show up the, what you're going to do here. Okay, so we get down to May 26, where we are. And this is telling you previously what to do. So tree sensitivity to normal drop and chemical thinners plays a role in here. Cool, sunny periods of good carbohydrate supply will lead to reduced natural drop and less response to the thinners. Cloudy, hot periods will give carbohydrate deficits and lead to stronger natural drop and stronger response to the thinner. Again, based on having a normal year with trees not under any type of stress. The four-day running average is used since studies and observations have shown that apple trees uh, does not respond to just one or two days of good or bad weather, so it has the capacity to respond more slowly to changes in the weather. And this model is telling you that you're increasing or decreasing your thinning application rate of the materials that you use based on a certain percentage. When we go to, uh, let me get back up here. When we go to the more information section, and look at the model overview, this tells you more about the apple carbohydrate thinning model. It's worth reading. I would suggest you do that. But then look at this table. So this table is the decision rules and what they're using to make the decisions based on the carbohydrate model. And this is all explained just above that table. So it's well worth reading. Okay, we also have apple irrigation. Uh, this estimates uh, the water use. So again, we don't really care about right now. Maybe we do, but we're going to look back. Just pick anything there. So for the apple irrigation model, Again, green tip date goes in. You need to insert the row spacing. So in row spacing, we'll say it's four feet. Between rows is 15 feet. It will tell you how many trees per acre. You need to decide if it's mature or if it's younger. This is going to make a difference in what, it, what it shows up. And then you hit the calculate button. And this is going to show you where you stand on a deficit of water or not. So if you're also irrigating, you would insert the amount of irrigation you're putting on a gallons per acre on any of those days. These numbers will then change. So you'll know whether you need to add water or don't need to add water. You know, maybe you can take a break on the irrigation as you're going forward. And then when you do put that in, so let's say here, let's see, we're running a deficit here. I'll put it at this one where we're having a deficit. So I'll say we put in 2,000, 200 gallons, 2,000 gallons. I need to hit the calculate button again at top. So I hit the calculate button and it's going to change things. It doesn't look like it's changing much on this because that was from history, but going forward on that day, you would put it in. So we'll put it in for here and see if it changes it. And again, I need to hit calculate. And it does. So it changes going forward where we're at to keep track of that as well. So it's a, it's a good model to use. We also have other things up here. We have the apple frost risk model, uh, but this actually is for more than apples, and this is from the Northeast Regional Climate Center. 
So here on the right, you would pick what, what stage you're at or a particular variety. But we also have grape on the left, the grape bud hardiness. We have turf grass. So there's a lot more in this as well. You can click on a particular screen and it will show up a little bit more. So if I want to do turf grass, it's going to show up even more. It's going to take me back to that same one where it has the different models for the different diseases for turf grass. Now we go to that one. And then on to crop pages. So under crop pages, you can click on any of these links. And this is going to give you a lot more information about that particular crop. So for apples, we have the different disease models here all in one spot. I mentioned the degree days. So if you go down here, it will tell you the degree day that is used. I said also that not everything is the same. So we have some that are 50, some are 43. So it's a very good resource for you to check out different information. And you can do that for different for the, these different crops that are on there. If you're interested in installing a rainwise weather station, which are the ones that we connect to the newest system, uh, you can click on this. You get more information about that one. If you're interested in purchasing a station for your site, all the information is here. If you decide to do it and you're in Connecticut, please let me know because I will then hook you up. Each state has a state coordinator, and we can get you back to we'll go back to the home page here eventually. Let's see if I can get back to the home page. Maybe not. Um, on the home page on the left hand side, you scroll down and you'll be able to see the different coordinators for each state. And by letting the coordinator know, that information then will be uploaded from your weather station to the newest system. And then your station will then show up on that page and we can start looking at, at everything that you have there as well. So spend time to go through the website. Uh, use it as a tool for your pest management, for irrigation, um, for um, uh, thinning models as well. Try the thinning model on a small area. I would not use it on your whole farm the first year until you really feel comfortable with it. And if you have any questions during the year, feel free to contact me. If you have any questions about anything on this webinar, please put your questions in the chat box, and then we can answer them for you now. And thank you for coming today. Mary, right now I don't see any questions, but we'll let you know if any come in. Mm-hmm. Well, if nobody has any questions, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this was recorded, as were the previous two, and our webinar tomorrow will also be recorded, and it will be put up on the IPM, UConn IPM website with links so you can go see it right there. So thank you for joining us today. Have a great day.